We got a handout uh, that's coming around, so uh, that'll be coming here. I am so excited to be here tonight. Um, I love this congregation. I've loved it for a number of years. Um, I guess it started when I was like two, because my dad preached here for a bit, and uh, I remember walking through these halls and probably uh, putting dents in the walls and things like that. Uh, my, probably my best memory or my, my most clear memory that I ever had here was that I found a staple on the floor and next to that staple was an electrical socket. And I thought, that looks like a good place to put this staple. And I did. I put the staple in there. Um, the results were shocking. And... Uh, I'd like to say that that's the last time that I was ever shocked again. That would be untrue, but at least I learned it as a kid not to do that. I love this congregation. I love hearing the, uh, the excitement of what you guys have going. Um, excited to hear about the expansion plans. And uh, just know a lot of people, Christians in the Denver area, are excited for you guys. Because uh, we're on the same team. It's about souls. It's about... Uh, uh, glorifying God, and it's awesome to work side by side, uh, whether it's down at Bear Valley or it's up here. Uh, we love you guys. I'm excited to speak tonight. Uh, this is a tough subject. You wouldn't think that it is, but the situation in which we live has made it tough. I love animals in general, and one of the things that I love about animals is just the unique ways that they will, the unique abilities they have and the unique ways that they will learn to survive. Uh, one of the things that I find very interesting is how animals will, will protect their young. So for example, if you're a crocodile, where might be the best place to protect your child? Well, that place would be in your mouth. Let's see if I can get this coming here. And so that's what crocodiles will do. Their young ones will hatch, and they'll, they'll grab the child, and they'll put it in its mouth, not to eat it, but to protect it. Know that there are predators out there that are seeking to take it out. We know that uh, wolf spiders, and I looked up a picture, I was like, I am putting that on there. <laughs> wolf spiders will have all the babies on their back, right? Because... They know that the, the mama wolf spider is much more mobile. It has the ability to protect the young. Even something as simple as wildebeest will get into massive groups because they realize that they're strengthened and that the enemy is looking for the young and he's looking for the weak. What about us as people when it comes to protecting our young? Now, of course, we as parents protect our young. But sometimes I wonder if we're protecting them from the right things. When I take a look at the demographics of youth, the faithfulness of youth, I'm sad to say we have a lot of improving to do. And we're going to talk about that quite a bit tonight. We as people maybe protect our children from physical harm, but are missing out on the greatest enemy that's, uh, that has his face against us and not protecting against him. And so we have a lot of work to do. I want to talk about the idea of the war for our teens. This may seem like a weird title, but I want to make it very clear that we are in a war, that this is a battleground and I'm sad to say that oftentimes we're losing the battle. And you've probably heard some of those statistics. And I'll give some more updated ones and some categories in which maybe we're, we're losing the battle. But I, I love the idea of what you guys are doing for these fifth Sundays as stronger families because, man, we need it. I need it. The, the families at Bear Valley need it. The families in the church at, in the United States need it. We need a shot in the arm. We need a, an encouragement and a reminder of the situation in which we are in because we are in a war. We are in a battle. And statistics are showing that too often we're losing the battle. 
This battle is not new. This battle has been going on for quite a while. And even back in Jesus' time, there's kind of a unique discussion that took place where we saw that battle. If you want to turn to Matthew chapter 21 and we look at verses 15 and 16, we're going to get an idea of what this battle was all about. We know that Jesus has made his triumphal entry. And as he's coming into Jerusalem, you know, the people are laying down the palm branches and people are, are talking about saying, you know, uh, Hosanna to the son of David, Hosanna in the highest. But, and, and you know, the Pharisees and scribes and all of the re- religious leaders were, you know, more or less tolerant of what was going on there, right? Until the children started saying things about Jesus. And then that was too much. Once their kids started saying Hosanna, they started getting really upset with that. And so when we look um, through this very quickly, we see three quick points. Number one, we see that the children were fought for. When you look at verses 15 and 16, But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things he had done, and the children who were shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became indignant And said to him, do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus said to them, yeah, yep, I hear it. See, he's made his triumphal entry. Why is that not a problem? They're fine with all the adults saying it, but once they're seeing their kid say it, no. And it's interesting the tactic that they use with Jesus. Okay, Jesus, are you really going to deceive kids here in their mind, right? That he's deceiving kids. Like, this is a new low, man. You're going to deceive kids? But the problem was is that the kids were seeing more clearly than even they were. And so we have a battleground here where these religious leaders are saying, this is wrong, and Jesus is saying, no, this is absolutely right. And so there's a battle that's taking place. Number two, we also see that the children mattered to Jesus. When we go to verse uh, 16, he just said, uh, as we read, do you hear what these children are saying? He said, yes. These kids matter to me. He knew exactly what he was doing. And there's been many times where he uh, healed children. You think about uh, Jarius' daughter. You think about the times when uh, he the children come to them. He said, don't hinder them. Because the children mattered to Jesus, and so he knew exactly what was going on and provides a good example to us that our kids, of course, should matter matter on a spiritual scale. Third, we see that the children even had an important role to Jesus. As we continue on in the text, he said, Yes, have you never read, out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have prepared praise for yourself. It's interesting to me that what was taking place here with Jesus was the fulfillment of prophecy. The kids had a role in Jesus being seen among the people and, uh, again, prophecy that this was going to be one of the things that would take place. They had an important role. The point that I'm making throughout all of this text is just simply that this battle has been taking place for a while, right? Right? And even on a spiritual scale, it was happening at Jesus' time, and that battle has continued to happen. It's maybe changed uh, tactics, but it's still going on today. When you think about the war for our teens and the fact that the battle is going to place, it makes us ask the question, who's the opponent? In the animal kingdom, when a lion is looking at the, the, you know, the herd... Who does he go for? I find it very interesting that the lion is going for the weak and the young. We know in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 that Satan is compared to what? A roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Church, we're fooling ourselves if we think that our children are not part of the target. Why wouldn't they be? 
why not use tactics within the nation to try to target the kids so that they never develop faith? Why not do what he can to try to undermine things so that the kids never become faithful? Why couldn't that be one of the tactics that he's using? And it's scary when we think about the idea that he's compared to a lion and what that really means in the animal kingdom about who he targets. I want to talk about tonight four main battlegrounds that are taking place in this war for our kids. Who's pulling on the other side? What tactics are being used? What, what's going on when we're losing our teens and, and they're going away? What kind of factors are taking place that's contributing to this discussion? I want to talk about four main battlegrounds. The first one is the child's development. The child's development. Now, of course, this is not Satan pulling, right? The kids develop. This is just part of the deal, right? But when we're talking about the child's development, what are we really saying here? What we're saying is kids are in a stage of life in which they may just naturally be resistant to things that are going on. Uh, in this packet that I've provided, uh, I've realized, first of all, uh, I have 14 years worth of material to cover in 45 minutes. And so uh, I provided some of the stuff in the handout just to try to give you information that you can maybe mull over uh, away from me um, and think about a little bit more. So first of all, you see this chart here. Uh, and this is not one that is earth shattering. It's just an idea that we know that Children go through different stages of development, right? Uh, we know that there's two, at least two major separations that sort of take place. You think about uh, terrible twos, right? Why is it that terrible twos is a thing? Well, the child has, is reaching a point developmentally to where he or she goes, oh, I'm my own person. You want me to go to bed? I don't want to. Okay? Uh, I have a three-year-old. Three-year-olds are when they get good at being two. And so the resistance is next level. Uh, and it's a lot of fun, also a lot of challenge. But we know, and there's, it's almost a cliche, that the second separation or another major one is when they become teenagers. And so uh, when you look at that adolescent age, there's early adolescence, middle, and late, and each of them can be very, very different. And uh, we know that that's taking place. Years ago, I decided to do a study where I took a look at the connection between what's happening in the development of the brain versus what's happening with faith and how that connects. And maybe none of this is earth shattering. I think it just helps us understand the people in who we, whom we are dealing with when it comes to children and teens and what might be happening developmentally. Uh, the reason I provided this is just so that we don't have to go through all of it right now. But I want to point out a couple of things. We know that what's happening in early, middle, adolescence is that the brain is developing mostly from back to front and that the frontal lobe is the last to be developed and that's responsible for a lot of complex decision making, uh, impulse control, um, and being able to handle more and more abstract concepts which is why a lot of times um, this is when teenagers decide to become Christians because they're reaching a point developmentally to where they go, oh, I'm, I'm now understanding that this, this whole thing of like God and faith and sin, those are abstract concepts. I'm understanding how that works. And so now I want to become a Christian. They're getting into that stage. But it also means that what's happening here during this stage is with uh, the development, there's going to be risky and maybe rebellious behaviors, right? And so there's kind of the cliche things that sometimes are having, happening during this time. There can be fighting and bullying. There can be sexual misconduct, uh, substance abuse, unsafe decisions, and all kinds of things that might be happening during this stage because there's an experiment with boundaries and life, okay? 
Then when they get into college, that's when the brain really starts taking off and developing to the point to where they're thinking complex and they're able to take these concepts uh, that they've been told and really analyze them and think about them. There's a guy by the name of Westerhoff that looked at these stages of development and he gave a key phrase to each one. If you look there, the, from zero to two, he just called it the observed faith, right? You got a little baby. What they're observing is very surface level. The idea is just, oh, we're going to church, right? It's like, oh, I'm going to go to Bible class. Oh, we sing songs, you know, very just observed. When you get to three to nine, he calls it the affiliative faith. And that is the idea of a child is saying, this is who we are as a family. We are Christians, we go to church. We don't talk that way. We don't watch those things, right? There's an idea of this is just who we are as a family. Then when you get into the early adolescence, there starts to the key phrase here is the searching faith or is this what I believe? And so, this is why it is a testing phase because of brain and cognitive development and because of the phase in which they in, teens will naturally ask the question, this is what my parents have said, but is this actually what I believe? And it's not an unfair question to ask, but it is a question that's being asked. And so what, let me walk you through this for just a minute. If a child is growing up in a family in which has said, this is what we do on Sundays. This is who we are. We are Christians. And then when they become a teenager, they say, but what about this? Or, you know, my friend does this, and I don't see why that's wrong. What's, why can't we do that? If they don't receive good answers to that, then it causes an oppor- it, it provides an opening or an opportunity to where the child says, Maybe this is not what I believe. We know oftentimes when these teens go into college, there's somebody that asks really challenging questions. If the foundation hasn't been solid, then those questions aren't being, can't be answered from their upbringing. And so that college professor says, well, what about this? And they don't have an answer. And oftentimes it shakes the faith of that teenager and oftentimes it's caused them to fall away from the truth. What are we saying? All we're saying is that this is a challenging phase. We're going to talk about solutions at the end. But we need to understand that one of the poles is that this is the development of kids, teens. And we find ourselves smack into in the middle of a is this what I believe phase. And we need to do a good job of uh, working through that as parents and as the church. The second major Uh, battleground is the culture's pull. The culture's pull. If you think about the messaging from our culture, it is one of idolizing beauty, right? You think about all of the products and the ways that, that people try to make themselves look good. And really what it is, is I want to make myself look young, right? And so there things like the cosmic surgery uh, industry, and this is worldwide, but $53 billion, almost $54 billion that people are spending to look younger or look more beautiful. In other words, they want to look young. Our culture says youth and, and, and looking young, man, that's where it's at. You think about the beauty industry at large, again, worldwide, over a $500 billion market where people are spending incredible amounts of money to look young and to look beautiful and to look youthful, okay? When you think about all kinds of uh, entertainment media, do you know the age range of American Idol? I believe you had to be under 25. Why? Because there's something special about taking a young talent and promoting them up. You think about things like little big shots, where again, you take a child and and say, what are your skills and your abilities? We want to see you. We want to see what you can do. Or the Little League World Series. You know, what's up with that? Nothing wrong with it. But there's something engaging about us as a culture looking at someone young 
and saying, we value you, right? We, we treasure you. If that's the message from the culture, but then the message from us as the church is, yeah, just, you know, we don't really have anything here for you. Well, I just kind of sit there, Dave, and, well, you know, when you grow up, then we'll have a good role for you. You know, if, that, if that's the message that they feel in the church or maybe at Home, uh, then that can be a challenge. When there, there's an idea of this pull from, uh, from culture, idolizing them. You know, we're very familiar with this passage in Proverbs 22, verse 6, right? Train up the child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. But the question that I have is, what if it's not us training them, number one? And number two, what if the ways in which they're being trained are wrong? Then when they grow up, could it be that then it will also be a challenge to depart from the ways in which they have been trained? And so the, the main question is, who is training our children? Who's giving messages about morals? Who's giving questions about faith in God and what is right and wrong in this life. I find it extremely interesting when you look back in history at the Nazis and the agenda in which they took in the education system. Uh, education was a major tool that was utilized by the Nazis uh, in order to promote radical policies and to do things that Hitler wanted to be accomplished. All teachers had to swear an oath of allegiance in order to be a teacher. All Jewish teachers were dismissed, as we know they had uh, you know, an agenda against the Jews. In Nazi Germany, no one was allowed to think for themselves. The core curriculum was introduced, and it was heavily monitored. And if any teacher strayed from the Nazi agenda, they were immediately dismissed, maybe worse. Because there was a very uh, purposeful effort to control the education of children. Because if you can control the textbooks, you basically build a militant following for you. And that's exactly, of course, what ended up happening in Nazi Germany. In a more modern way, we know that Islam is also um, a lot of radical agenda. A few years ago, a quote really caught my attention where uh, this guy Hassan said, the content of the current courses in the 12 subjects, they basically banned 12 subjects, uh, is not in harmony with religious fundamentals, and they are based in Western schools of thought. Now, the question that comes from that is, what kind of things were they banning? Here are a few. The banning of law. You can't study law. The banning of philosophy, don't think outside of where we want you to think. Human rights, don't think about other people as humans. Women's studies, we don't want women to think that they have more roles than they do. Political science, the idea really that you can see from these things is we only want you to think what we want you to think and do what we want you to do and don't think out of that. And so they ban to control the textbooks, control the children, and therefore build a militant following. Well, we don't have any kind of problems like that in our schools today, do we? No, I mean, it's not like to that extreme, right? But prayer is banned in schools. Religion cannot be taught in schools, but evolution is and can, right? Right? We know that they are introducing bathrooms where there's third gender. Uh, in California in 2017 was the first time that that was introduced. And of course, I'm saying schools in general. It's not every school everywhere. But there's certainly, uh, and we know that uh, LGBTQ uh, agendas are being promoted even to grade schoolers. I was talking to uh, um, one of the teacher one of the members at Bear Valley who's a first grade teacher, and he was talking about how he's regularly given uh, these books 
that are LGBTQ, and he's expected to run to his kids, to the, to the kids in his classroom. He says, I have a cabinet. I open it up, and I put it up there, and I close it, and that's it. And that's where they stay. Now, I'm, uh, I'm not going to say, I'm not promoting that everyone pull their kids out of school and go homeschool. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying we need to understand and recognize that there is a, a, a from our culture to raise our kids, to teach them, and to have them believe things that we uh, would not support as Christians. And again, we're losing the battle. Let me show you a couple of statistics. Uh, Gallup poll recently asked people abroad uh, what they claimed for their sexual preference. It's going to be a little bit hard to see from the distance, but back in 2012, from their sample size, they had 3.5% that claimed to be LGBTQ. In 2021, it's now 7.1%. Now, if this is true across all of America, if their sample size rings true for all of America, then what we're talking about is nearly double, okay? We're talking about 7 million people that have increased or have, are now claiming to be LGBTQ. Here's the one that really, really scares me, was they broke a lot of these down by demographics and looked at the age groups and asked the same question. And here's what they found. They have some of the older generations in this bottom category, right, to where it's 0.8% that claim to be LGBTQ, right? Older, 2.6%, a little bit older, 4.2%. Millennial, which is my uh, general demographic, up to 10.5%. That's high. That one in 10 millennials are saying, I fall into the LGBTQ. But do you see the Gen X? 20.8% of Gen Xers are saying, I fall into the LGBTQ category. I pulled these statistics a year ago, and it was 15.8%. Adding one more year, right, because they are only taking people who are 18 years old or and older. When they added one more year, it jumped up 5%. Why is it that there's such a dramatic increase from older folks to our younger folks? It has to be our culture's pull. It has to be at least a strong factor in what's taking place in our society, what's being promoted at schools, what's happening on TV. Here's another statistic for you. Again, it's going to be a little bit hard to see, but they ask the question, how much screen time are you as a teenager spending? Girls were spending about eight hours per day. Guys were spending about nine hours per day on screens. And surely that's all wholesome educational material, right? This is uh, Disney Plus, which has already very publicly said we will be putting LGBTQ material in basically every movie and show going forward, right? We're talking about who knows what type of influences and messages that are being received. So when we look at the amount of screen time, when we're looking at education, what we have is we have a strong cultural pull, and one of the results is the dramatic increase and support of LGBTQ. Now, that's not the only thing. There are certainly many others, but I think that's a really strong, scary indicator of what might be happening in our society. When we look at the religious landscape in general, Pew Research uh, took a look at the time span, as is said here, between 2007 and 2021. They looked at those that claimed to be Christian of any denomination, right? And they found that it had dropped 15%, okay? And it down to America was now, America that claimed to be Christian was 65%. Now, that to me doesn't, or 63%, that to me doesn't, like, I don't understand that. And so it helps if I have like a number. So what we're talking is that drop represents about almost 50 million people from 2007 to 2021. About 50 million people uh, said, I'm no longer going to claim to be Christian. And then on the 
side is they looked at the unaffiliated. What that means is they just say, I don't claim any religion in particular. I've left religion, or I'm atheist, or I'm just not going to associate myself with a group. And it's risen almost the same amount, 13%. Uh, or 43 million people if these statistics prove true for the entire United States. So you have nearly 50 million people that said, I'm no longer Christian, and 43 million people that said, I don't claim a faith. Why? Why is this happening in our society? Again, it has to be the messaging that's happening from our Culture as at least a part of what's taking place. Uh, and it's, it scares me to take a look at this. The third major, major battleground is the church's ignorance. I'm not saying that the church uh, has no idea what's going on, but what I'm saying is there are maybe some messages that are coming from those that are leaving the church that the church doesn't understand or know what they're saying. Uh, there's a book written by David Kinn and he's the leader or the president of the Barna Group. His uh, book is called You Lost Me. And I've provided these upcoming slides because we're going to go pretty fast through them, where he basically messaged a bunch of people who had left the church, left faith in general, and just said, why? Just tell us why you left. And they gave six major categories about why they left faith. Let me very quickly go through them. The first one is that they claimed that the church was overprotective that it uh, demonized things that maybe it didn't have to demonize. Um, let me give you a very quick example. I have a youth minister buddy uh, down in Mississippi. One of the teens said, why is it sinful to not wear a suit on Sunday? Well, that says a lot about what was being demonized at that church, that if you didn't show up in a suit, it was equal to sin. Well, that can be an example of something that's being demonized church be overprotective. Don't see this. Don't go to this. Uh, don't even get close to this, right? And some of that is true and right, but this is what they found the church to be. Number two, they found it to be shallow. Um, they found church to be boring, didn't connect to them, that the, what was being taught in the classroom was not, didn't have much depth. It didn't relate to them. They found it to be shallow and boring. Number three, they found it to be anti-scientific, meaning I don't see what you're saying and how it relates to science because sometimes the message has been, well, you just have to have faith instead of giving good logical reasons that agree with science about why we believe what we believe. And sometimes we've just not known those things. We've not had good answers. And they also, one of the things that I found really interesting was this third one, that they were turned off by the verse evolution debate. It may be we've, over, we've talked about it too much. We've overset it. And to where the view from, from teens and young adults is, this is just an ugly conversation. And I don't want to see the ugly conversation. Not that the conversation can't be had, but it's just ugly. Fourth is that he called, the word that he used was repressive. And the idea was that it, they felt like it limited their freedom. So uh, maybe they want to pursue a particular lifestyle. And the church says, well, no, you can't. Okay? Now, some of those may have been sinful, and the church was right in that. But again, this is what they're saying. Fifth category was they found it to be exclusive. Uh, you have to be just, you know, fit into this mold in order to be a part of the congregation. The sixth one is they found it to be doubtless. What that means is you can't doubt. Don't ask questions. Just go on faith. And, you know, that's, if you are asking questions, you don't have enough faith. You need to have more faith. Now, I find this interesting when you look at these six major categories about them finding the church to be overprotective, shallow, anti-scientific, repressive, exclusive, and that you can't have doubts. Some of these is maybe more the denominational world. But let's not think that a lot of these is missing even in our own congregations. Because I do know that there are teens that ask hard questions and that there have been times that they've not gotten good answers. 
I do know that the message from our culture is giving information. And when they come back to the church and they say, I don't know how to deal with this, there may not be good answers. I had a young lady that uh, approached me in my youth group a few years ago. And she said, I just am not sure that I think that the Bible is from God. But I can't go talk to my parents about that. And honestly, it kind of broke my heart in a couple of ways. Why did she feel like she couldn't have a doubt? And two, why is it that she didn't feel comfortable expressing that doubt to the closest people to her, her family? It's because perhaps there has been this idea that you can't ask questions and you can't have doubts. And so we as the church, as congregations, need to be much better about uh, how we're approaching our teens uh, and our children teaching well in a way that connects. And we'll talk more about that here in just a minute. The fourth major category is the family's neglect. And perhaps this is the largest category. Before. When families are strong, the kids will be strong, by and large. And when we're taking a look at statistics and what's happening, and I'm going to give them to you in just a minute, about why teens are falling away, so often it's connected to the pattern that the family has been laying down for them. Several years ago, uh, there was a political figure uh, here, John Francis Adams. He took his son fishing, and he wrote about it in his diary and I find it really interesting that also Brooks Adams wrote about it in his diary too as a child. And the two were very different. John said, went fishing with my son today, a day wasted, was his perspective. What a waste of a day. Maybe he thought I could be furthering my political career. I could have gotten a lot of things done, whatever his perspective was. Brooks said, went fishing with my father the most wonderful day of my life. I wonder if sometimes we as, as parents, and I'll be the first to raise my hand, we forget how valuable the time that we're spending with our kids is. To where it may seem boring or whatever to us, to them it is literally the greatest thing that they have experienced. When we're taking a look at families and the types of things that are happening, we need to understand, and I think there's a couple of quotes that help, uh, define this as we move on, that children learn what they live. What that means is what the child is learning at home is eventually what they're going to do and become as they become adults, okay? Second, and I've tried to track down a source for this, I just can't find it. What parents excuse in moderation, children will abuse in excess. When a, ch when a parent says, yeah, we're, you know, this is okay, as the child grows up, oftentimes they take that to the next step. And we're going to see that here a lot of times when it comes to faithfulness. Several years ago, um, I heard about one of our uh, sister congregations that did uh, a poll of their youth group. They took a look at their teens. It's the Palm Beach Lakes Church of Christ down in Florida. Solid congregation. About a 350-member congregation. Uh, really known for being a good, healthy congregation. Uh, they pulled their teens. And they took a look and they said, how many people and how many not? Uh, they found, and this is pretty much the statistic that you heard probably, that uh, about 50% fell away. They looked about a 10-year time, 151 graduates that came through their youth program, and they had about 50 that fell away, uh, a little less than 50 uh, that remained faithful. But what I really appreciated about what they did is they started asking questions about why. Why did our teens fall away? What were some common factors that they had? And so they looked at common factors of those who fell away. They found that those who fell away, 62% didn't have a faithful father. 62% did not have a faithful father. They found 72% did not have a faithful mother. I find it interesting that uh, 
that the mothers were more impactful here. Okay? They also found that 80% were not involved in their youth program. So they're just not involved, not engaged with what was going on. And that 90% did not attend a regularly attend Bible class and worship. Why would they if they're going to not be faithful, right? Or uh, that 90% were only coming on Sunday morning, okay? So the picture here is didn't really have a faithful dad, didn't really have a faithful mom, weren't involved in the youth program, didn't worship. Okay? We will and say, well, that's not a huge surprise that they fell away. But we need to understand the impact of what is helping to keep kids faithful. They did the same thing with those who remain faithful. They just said, okay, why? What, what's going on here? They found that 70% of those who remain faithful have a faithful father. Okay? Dad's faithful. Kids are likely faithful. They found that 90% had a faithful mother. I wonder where the 20% of those dads were. Also, I find it interesting that moms uh, are more impactful than dads. They found that 85% were involved in the youth program. And they found that 97% regularly attended Bible study and worship. Now, not earth-shattering, or at least it shouldn't be. But I think there's a couple of really major messages here, right? What's happening with uh, keeping kids faithful? Faithful parents engage with the church. It's, it, right? That, that's what it takes. So then why is it that we see then statistics like this that are modern where we have 64% of our teens falling away after high school? Why is that happening? Why is it that, you know, we, you've probably heard the 50%, it's gotten worse. It's gotten worse over time to where now it's 64%. Uh, this LifeWay research did one as well where they just asked them, did you stop attending church for a year or more? Uh, and they found that 66% uh, at that time, which is about, you know, pretty on par with what we just saw, said, yeah, I stopped going. 62% or 66%. I've even seen some statistics of upwards of 70% that are saying no longer faithful. And these are even just a couple of, of years out of date. Well, what's going on? Why are we losing so many teens? It's because we have missed the fact that we are in a battle. We're in the ground. And we're losing the fight. And we have to do something different. We have to realize that there's something going on and we have more to do. Um, Satan is after us. Satan is after our kids. He's after our teens. And it's sad to say that he's good at it. It breaks my heart as a youth minister to think about so many of the kids falling away. I did a sample size like this at Bear Valley about four years ago. Where I decided to ask myself, as a school dude, to be honest with you, I went ahead and asked the question, how many of the teens at Bear Valley have we lost? And I went through and looked at every teen did the best I could and messaged some and talked to some parents and said, tried to figure out how many teens have remained faithful at Bear Valley. We had, uh, at the time, a 72.4% remained faithful. Okay, so if 65% of society and the church at large is losing, but 72% at Bear Valley were remaining faithful, it just, it led the question, Why? And far and away, the most common factor was that we had rock star parents who were so engaged with their faith that it translated to their... Looked at the, you know, the 27, 28% that had fallen away, not faithful parents. Maybe it was only one parent. 
engaged in the congregation, right? Again, this isn't rocket but we're losing the battle. Let's quickly, with our time left, let's talk about, again, I love this theme of being stronger and, uh, and working on these things together. So let me try to give some practical suggestions about what we can do uh, in these categories to try to, uh, go, to counter each of these battlegrounds that we have. When we're talking about child's development, we need to understand and recognize the situation, right? They are in a time of life that can be rebellious, or can be going against um, what we want as parents. And so a couple of things that we can do is we can have solid Christian mentors in place. One of my favorite things about being a youth minister is that I get to back up what you're teaching at home. I love that. I love that I can be like, oh, the right way to do that. Like, yeah, my mom had been saying that. It's like, great. Then that means that I'm saying the same thing, but maybe coming from me, it'll be a little bit different because I'm not your dad, right? And so... If you can have a solid Christian mentor in place, then it can help back up what's going on at home. I, man, God's wisdom with the church often just tells me and, and is so profound when you look at it. When we have, you know, 50 moms and dads, you have 50 grandmas and grandpas that can help mentor and connect uh, with our children, maybe a way to where your child isn't listening to it, you. Um, be the example. Let them see faith in you to see, uh, you know, that way they don't go home and go, well, I see mom and dad saying this, but at home, that's just not the way it is. And also, don't give up. Keep teaching. Keep mentoring. Keep working at it. Eventually, it will begin. When we about uh, the culture's pull, uh, we need to recognize and admit that our culture does have agendas for our children. They do. They do have agendas for our children, and they would love nothing more than to take our kids and align it up with uh, the things that they promote and teach. We need to stop being passive as parents. If there's one thing that maybe I see anything else when it comes to parents in today's society, it is passively letting things happen with kids, right? Again, how do eight to nine hours of screens occur with perfect supervision? I, I don't think it can. I don't think that it is happening. And so we need to stop being passive and start taking things by the reins and making maybe hard decisions about uh, what we're going to allow in our house and what we're going to talk about and what's going to be allowed to take place. Um, having conversations about what happened at school, what were you taught, uh, what happened with friends. Oh, you have a friend that's claiming this thing. Let's talk about this thing and really being engaged with that. Uh, having honest discussions just you know skirting issues but having real conversations about these issues with our kids and maybe placing some really hard limitations what if we said you know you get two hours of screens per day and that's it do you know you can place limitations on devices and things it, um, uh, like modems and routers and things like that that really control and will limit not only what can be accessed, but also how long it can be accessed. Um, I can give a couple of those if you're interested in. Um, maybe also the limitations are no, uh, no screens in rooms. Because nothing happens in private with screens, right? What if we said, no, that's not going to be allowed anymore. Maybe we need to make some tough decisions for the sake of the souls of our teens. When we talk about the church's ignorance, maybe we need to recognize past mistakes, and I think it's going to be different for every congregation. right? Some congregations maybe are worse than others, some are better than others, but if there's been mistakes, mistakes that we've neglected our teens, or we've, we've not done things that have been good for them, or we've just like been passive, recognize those 
past mistakes and say, man, we're going to do something different. Too often, it's almost as if teens are being seen as second-class members. What I mean by that is not that, like, you're not valuable, but it's just like, we just don't have anything for you here. Like, we don't have, you know, any kind of dedicated Bible classes. We're not going to put a lot of resources into training. Oh, well, you know, you're not, a, you're not developed in your faith yet. And so, you know, and there's a lot of these conversations that can happen. where It's almost as if they're a second-class citizen, and we're missing the fact that what we have with teens are some of the most genuine, hardworking, sincere uh, members of the Lord's church. We have an untapped resource oftentimes of almost limitless energy. Amazing things. But perhaps what we've done as a society and as a church is we have um, misunderstood how impactful teens can be on the world. Did you know that's how we change the world? Today's teens become tomorrow's adults, tomorrow's preachers, tomorrow's elders, deacons, wives, tomorrow's evangelists, today's evangelists. If we are focused on our kids, they will go on to impact the world. If we don't focus on them, the world will impact them. Um, we need to make sure that we're giving good, honest answers to biblical questions. I don't know how many times I've had, uh, heard an example of a teen that asked an honest question and they got a wishy-washy answer and it turned out to be uh, something that impacted their faith and caused, or at least was a factor in them falling away after high school. We need to have good answers. And if you don't know the answer, okay. I don't know the answer. I'll let me look into it, and I'll come back, and I'll give you the answer. Um, have good answers that are going to stand the test of time so that when we become adults, they're going to have that foundation. And lastly, when we talk about the family's neglect, guys, God has to be number one. He has to be. If he's not number one, in our life, why would he, we expect him to be number one in their life? And there are so many times to where we allow something else to become number one. Sports becomes number one. They're, we're we're going to miss out on spiritual activities because there's a game and there's, we paid money and there's expectations for us to be there. What does that communicate? To the kid. Oh, you have a lot of homework. Well, education is number one. And so, you know, we want you to have good grades, even if it comes at the sacrifice of faith. Sometimes that's the message that can come. Do we want our kids to get to heaven or to be strong athletes? Do we want our kids to get to heaven or make straight A's? I know sometimes those can both happen. But if, if my kid pulls C's but makes it to heaven, that's a win. That's a win. God has to be number one. We need to step up and do what God has asked us to do. We look at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. It specifically is talking about fathers raising up your kids in, in the uh, uh, discipline of the Lord, the nurture, training, discipline of the Lord. The statistics showed, at least at the Palm Beach Lakes, that moms were more engaged in the faith development of their kids than the dads were. Doesn't mean the dad, obviously there were some dads in there. But fellas, God has asked for us to step up and to be the, the leaders of our families. And God expects us to do that. We're going to stand one day before the Lord and have to answer for how we've raised our kids and hopefully what we can say is that I did everything I could to raise up my kids. Faith. We also know, as we talked about in Proverbs 22, 6, train up the child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. If the training, again, when you think about statistics, are we are going to be involved 
at church. Faith is number one in our lives. We're going to be involved in the youth program. This is who we are. This is what we're going to be engaged in. They don't part from that. As we saw, uh, you know, 80, 90% that are engaged and remain faithful. The last, but certainly not the least, is to be consistent. I want you to turn over to Deuteronomy 6 real quick with me as we begin to close up. I find it interesting what was being instructed in Deuteronomy 6 about how to uh, engage with the kids and what they needed to do in order to help keep them faithful. We're going to look at Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 8. When you back up to verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all of your might. These words which I'm commanding to you shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your son. And taught you of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be on the frontals of your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. How many different ways is faith being seen here? Did you catch it? You got up in the morning, and they're talking about what's going on with God. When they're going to bed that night, we're going to talk about what's going on with God. When you're leaving the house, there's going to be like, Messages posted on right, right on the doorposts, you know. Maybe it's scriptures or it's it's a spiritual thought, right? It's a visual, right? You're going to have it uh, written on your hands, almost, right? Like a scripture of the day on your hand. Even it says to be on your forehead. Sometimes they would wear kind of these headbands that would have this little uh, little dangly thing, and one of the things they would do is write a scripture on it and roll it up and tuck it in that. And as you would walk, it would maybe kind of hit your forehead. And as a reminder, almost a reminder all day of the thing that you wrote in that. The idea was this is a constant, consistent, purposeful effort to have it permeate the day. When we think about all of the ways that we as parents can be bringing these types of messages before our kids, I feel like this is a great example. You know, okay, do you have to write it on your hand? No. Do you have to go get a headband that's going to, you know, no. But can we uh, wake up in the morning and talk about faith? Can we talk about what Jesus has done for us? Pray together in the morning and at night have family devotionals, you're going to school and you're thinking about a scripture and you're talking to your kid about faith, you pick them up from school and asking what happened in that day and there's a spiritual message or a correction or a scripture that can come to mind that applies to the situation, right? Maybe there's messages or little posty notes up on the the bathroom mirror or, or next to the door as you leave. Maybe there's something in the car You can see there's a million ways in which we can incorporate faith into our lives and into our families, just so that the communication is clear that this is who we are and this is number one in our lives, right? This is a scary battle, but that doesn't have to be where it sits. far as it depends on you individually, get your kids to heaven, right? That's all that you're asked to be responsible for. We have a lot to work on. We have a lot to do. I'll be the first to raise my hand, right? But we're talking about our, one of our most, if not our most precious possession, right? Our kids. We so badly want them to go to heaven. I want to thank you guys so much for uh, your attention tonight. Uh, if there's anything that I can do to help, I, I'm here. I'll, I'll do anything I can to help. But I appreciate you, and let's uh, work hard for our kids.